Let's go to the word of the Lord this morning. Two places we're going to read. Mark, Mark chapter 9 and then we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Mark chapter 9, we'll read from chapter, chapter 9 from verses 33 to 35. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 4 to 7. We continue on as we close out the month of May under the theme of the way of service. The way of service. Out of Mark chapter 9, 33 and verse 35, Jesus then, the Bible says, Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all. And then he said, servant of all. We go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 and verse 7. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the prophet of all. I want you to take note for a moment. Jesus states emphatically that we are servant of all. And then the apostle Paul calls us to prophet of all. I want you to hold that thought very clearly this morning as our golden thread throughout this teaching. I am servant of all for prophet of all. I want you to hold that thought. I am servant of all for the profit of all. By way of introduction this morning, in building a case for the way of service that each child of God is called for, I would like to present you with a specific premise this morning. That premise is basically put as this. We don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to ourselves. Now this premise is in direct opposition of what is presented to us in popular culture. The focus in popular culture is on what can I get for myself. There's been a way, a move away from common decency. I move away from respect and concern for the other. More and more popular figures are showcasing to us that your public persona can be used to generate clicks, likes, and ultimately recognition. Nothing gets done these days without the need for praise and without the need of having a camera propping us up when we do the things that is easy for us to do. When we don't like a comment that is negative, when we don't like a comment on our social media pages, we can go and delete it. As if we want to feel that there can be no negativity in our worlds. There can be no negativity and all we long for is for positivity and for praise. Incidentally, popular culture uses a Q score rating that measures the popularity, the familiar, familiarity, and the appeal of celebrities, brands, and companies. They use what is called a Q score. That's why certain celebrities, brands, and companies are foremost in popular culture. It's more than just an algorithm. It's more than just your social media um, algorithms showing you who you must follow and who you must like and all of these things. It's become an actual science. How do I know this? Let me give you a case study. Apple. I love Apple. All Apple products in our home. There's only one person in our home that doesn't have an Apple product or an Apple phone. Apple gave a directive to Hollywood and the entertainment industry 
that no Apple product must be placed in the hands of a villainous character. So just watch a movie. Watch your, your, your shows that you watch on TV. You will not see any bad character have an Apple product in their hands. So what are they conditioning us to think? That Apple are only for good people. Apple can only be put in the hands of good characters. Apple can raise their brand so that you and I believe that only good virtuous characters must use Apple. Thus, we would then allow certain people with dubious characters, certain people with questionable characters, we will accept them easier because they carry Apple. Because they are perceived to be what? Good. They are perceived to be what? Virtuous. So even though they have dubious characters, can I mention some names? Let me not mention names. Because I'm not here to condemn anybody. The people that we follow, they may have dubious characters, but because an algorithm tells us to follow them, we follow them. Because they wear the brands that we like, we follow them. Without even questioning their character. Without even questioning the fact that they've got so many skeletons in their closets, we will follow them. Because the world says, <clears throat> we must look out for number one. Books, podcasts, seminars, video series are produced to entrench in our psyche, in our value system, in our way of living that you must look out for yourself. That's why we see an increased breakdown in relationships. Not just in our homes, in general. Because my feelings, my truth, my opinion is more important than somebody else's. It's Oprah Winfrey that introduced this concept of my truth. Oprah Winfrey introduced this concept of my truth. At, at one award ceremony, she spoke about standing for your truth. Family, there's only the truth. Your truth, my truth cannot battle the truth. Your truth, my truth, my lived experience, your lived experience pales in comparison to the truth. The children of God must follow the truth. There's a poem by William Ernest Henley called Invictus. Very famous poem. It is said that the night... Before 1990, in the 1995 World Cup, it was read to our Springbok team. And the last two lines of this poem says, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. These words, these words, these two lines, all of us have said it in some way or form. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. These words allude to the pursuit of self. These words focus on self-preservation. I want to say that as the children of God, this focus of the self cannot be our lives. Because again, the premise is set, I do not belong to myself. Go back to our golden thread this morning. I am servant of all for the profit of all. I am servant of all for the profit of all. The child of God cannot focus on self. The child of God cannot be concerned with self. How do we know this? Jeremiah 10, 23, the New Living Translation. I know, Lord, that our lives are not our own. We are not able to plan our own course. Take it a bit further. Read it in another version or another translation. It says, oh, Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks 
to direct his own steps. We do not belong to ourselves. The prophet Jeremiah makes it plain that we do not plan our own lives. Nor could we ensure that we will see every plan that we devise make it to success. God's will stands as our guiding principle. Paul the Apostle takes our position even further. He doesn't speak of it in terms of just your spiritual nature. In terms of your emotional state. He brings it and he takes it to the fulcrum of it all and he says, but in the physical and the natural, we are not our own. How do we know this? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. The ownership of who we are is set out clearly. We do not belong to ourselves. Paul in Romans chapter 1 calls himself a bond servant to Christ. A bond servant. He says, and I want to give you three understandings of what a bond servant means. Because in the biblical times, there were three types of indentured servants. Some people in this very room, your, your family tree, your family lineage in the presence of South Africa is counted because of indentured servanthood. Some of you say, Pastor... You just went over my head. The Cape Malay, the Indonesians that came to South Africa, the Indians that came to South Africa, came to South Africa as indentured servants. Our history in this country of every person of color is indentured servant, servitude. Every person of color. So biblical times tells us this. You were either born into indentured servitude. You either pledged your life as a servant in exchange for necessities. Or thirdly, where a person incurs a debt he cannot pay off. Except by becoming a servant to pay off their debt. So Paul takes point three and he says... I have been bought with a price. He says, my life is not my own. I am a bond servant to Christ. That means as children of God, we take cognizance of the fact that he saved us. We take cognizance of the fact that it was his blood that redeemed us. Therefore, we are not our own. We are but bond servants to what he has called us to be. We are servant of all to the prophet of all. Siloam, we must willingly submit and yield ourselves to the permanent service of the Lord. Now everything I'm saying this morning flies in the face of popular culture even in the church. That all we care about is favor. All we want is the blessing. All we need is prosperity. We are not our own. We are bond servants. Because he paid a price for us. I have a few questions I need to ask. Number one, who do we belong to if we are not our own? We are the Lord's. 1 Corinthians 3 and 23 says, And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Who do we belong to? We belong to the Lord. How do we know this? Acts 17 and 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. 
In him we live and move and have our being. We are the Lord's. You and I are not our own. We are Christ's. In every sense, we are Christ's. Body, mind, and spirit. We are members of Christ's body. Our bodies are his temple. We are bond slaves to Christ who made us his children of his father and fellow heirs of his estate. We have a master over us and his name is Jesus. We have a Lord over us and his name is Jesus. So who do we belong to? We are the Lord's. Number two, who do we belong to? We are accepted in the beloved. Romans 9, 25 to 26. And he also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. And her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7 says, To the praise of his glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We know that the word beloved here is in reference to Jesus. So we understand that when he says and he calls, we call him the beloved, he turns around and he calls you and I his beloved. You are accepted in the beloved. Just look next to you very quickly. Look at your neighbor. If he calls them beloved, you are their beloved. You are accepted here. I don't know how I can stress this even more, but you are accepted in this community of faith. You are accepted in this church. You are accepted as a son and a daughter of God. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. You are accepted. Even if our sins can be counted as high as a mountain, even if our sins can be counted to the depths of the sea, we are accepted in the beloved. He calls us his own. He calls us his family and we are family to one another. <coughs> we are accepted. Look at the person next to you and tell them you are accepted. <laughs> words and all. Tell them words and all. With all your nonsense. With all of the troubles in your life, with all of the struggles in your life, you are accepted here. Second question we have to ask. First question was, who do I belong to? Second question is, where do I belong? Number one, we belong in the will of the Father. You belong in the will of the Father. Matthew 6 and 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Life has many pursuits that we all engage in, but there's no greater pursuit than the will of the Father. There's no greater pursuit than the manifestation of the kingdom. There is no greater pursuit than representing God's will in this world. How do we know this? Hebrews 10 and 36 says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The promise of God is connected to His will. 
And what you and I need is to endure. What you and I need is perseverance. What you and I need is to have the intestinal fortitude to stand and have resilience in the moments of our lives when it does not seem that the will of God is being realized or manifesting. There is a word for someone here this morning. You are in the will of God even when times seems dark and you have no clarity about your next steps and whether you will be able to, to make it. You are in the will of God, Siloam, even if you can't see it. You are in the will of God even if you can't feel him. You are in the will of God even if you know that I'm doing everything I can but I still feel like I am stuck. How do I qualify this to you this morning? Peter walked on water but he sank the moment he took his eyes off Jesus. But he was still saved because he followed the command of Jesus to get out of the boat and to walk on water. He followed the command even though he took his eyes off. There is a word for somebody here this morning. You may not see the blessing. You may not see the favor. You may not see it's going well with you. But if you obey and follow his command if you hear his voice and he says get out of the boat you get out of the boat you are in the will of the father when you get out of the boat you are in the will of the father when you follow his commands when you follow his commands he is there to save you he is there to sustain you because when Peter went under it was the hand of the Lord that stretched out and pulled him out. The Lord will not let you go under when you are in his will. Some of you are still not convinced. You are still not convinced that I'm in his will even when I don't see it. Some of you are still not convinced that I'm in his will. Even though I know that I have proclaimed that he is God and Lord over my life. Even though I have followed the church's program of jumping from one program of, of fasting into another program of fasting. I know, I know I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. But I don't see the will of God. I don't see the blessing follow me. I don't see the things I'm supposed to see. You are in the will of God. How do we know this? Ask the three. Hebrew boys when the others were asked to worship an idol they stood firm and they stood bold they said to the king they said even though he doesn't save us even though he doesn't keep us and take us out of the fire we will not bow to any other God and even when you send us and you turn up the fire seven times even if you turn it up and you put me in a place of desolation I I will lift up of my voice. I will lift up my eyes and I will see the fourth man in the fire standing next to me. You are in the will of the Father. You are in the will of the Father because you belong to Him. <coughs> you belong to Him. God's will sustains us God's will holds us God's will will not let you go you see we want physical things we want money we want to see the bank account go from 0 to 10 billion just like that and we are get we get upset lord i'm giving Lord, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. But the fact that he gives you the strength, the fact that he places you where he places you, the fact that in all of this economy that everybody else says that there are over 32% of people unemployed in this country, young people, the fact that there's over 40 something percent young people uh, unemployed in this country, here you stand with a job. Here you stand and everybody else is favoring you. You want to see the physical thing when the Lord says just open your eyes, look around you. It could go worse with you. It could go much worse with where you are. But here you stand and you can still hold your head up because you are in my will. 
Where do I belong? Where do I belong? I belong in life-giving covenantal relationships. 1 Samuel 23, 15 to 18. So David saw that Samuel, that Saul had come out to seek his life. And David was in the wilderness of Ziv in a forest. Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear for the hand of Saul. My father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord and David stayed in the woods and Jonathan went to his own house. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. You and I belong in life-giving covenantal relationships. A covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together to reach a common goal. Covenant is the basis of meaningful relationships in life. It clarifies our priorities by distinguishing between those with whom we are to build life with versus those who are merely passing by in my life. Most importantly, covenant is the basis of our relationship with the living God through His Son, Jesus the Christ. People of biblical covenant see what God sees, what others, they see what God sees and not what others sees. People of biblical covenant see what God sees. People of biblical covenant does what they see, what God sees you belong in this place. I already said to you, you are accepted in the beloved, but you need a brother and a sister that stands with you. You need a brother and a sister that upholds you. You need a brother and a sister that focuses on what the Lord says. I can say to you, Marcus, you thinking you have nothing, but listen, you still in the will of God. Marcus, you think you don't have anything to go on, but I'm here to to pray for you. I'm here to stand with you. Do you have people in your life that can stand with you and see what God sees? Or do you have people in your life that sees things as they want to see it and they put a jacket on you? They put chains on you. They're not happy when you get out of the boat. They're not happy when you say that I want to praise the Lord. They're not happy. My brother's and my sisters, not everyone in your life is there for good. Not everyone in your life is there to lift you up. So you need to be able to say, I belong in life-giving covenantal relationships. There are people in this very room that I stand in relationship with. They know I don't talk to them every day. But the moment they pick up that phone, they understand stuff will happen. Things will happen. Because that's what covenant does. I don't need you around me all the time. But when I need you, I know you are there. When I need you, I know you will do what you need to do. I know you will build with me what God wants built in this house. I know you will build with me the faith of my children when they cannot see us being successful. You will build with me. You will speak a word into my child's life that when I am not there, they will be upheld. There are people that we do things for. People that will tell me, how do we repay you? How do we do this? Janine and I tell them this all the time. You don't need to pay me back. But when my children need you one day, when my children, when we are no longer there to be a, a, a support to my children you must be there to lift them up I don't need you to pay me money I don't need you to give me anything I don't need anybody in this church to come and fall before my knees and fall before me and say oh my pastor I love you no I don't need that I need people that can say pastor let's walk in relationship to do what God wants to do pastor let's walk in relationship to perform and bring the manifestation of the Lord in this house you need people that can fight with you. 
You need people that can say, listen, even though Saul is my father, even though my father and I am in line to get his throne, I know the anointing is on you. I know the anointing has been given to you. I know the purpose has been given to you. I will do everything I can to ensure that you see what God has promised. How do we make and build covenantal relationships? You have to be intentional with your relationships. You have to be intentional with your relationships. You define the relationship so both you and the person have a clear understanding of covenant expectations. I meet many pastors. And in this season of my life, there's lots of pastors that want to meet me as well, which is fine. Which I love because we're building relationships. And I say this in every meeting before I leave, even if it's the first time. I don't need anything from you. I just need you to be my brother. I don't need you to give me anything. I don't need to be on your pulpit. I don't need to be invited to your church to preach. Let's just be brothers. We must be very clear with people. I don't need you to do X, Y, and Z for me. I need you to be my brother. I need you to be my sister. I need you to pray for me. I need you to cover me. I need you to know that when I am going through some things, I'm going to pull, pull, pick up that phone and say, I need you now. I need you now. And I don't need you, 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 even if we are thousands of kilometers apart from each other, I know that I will get a word when I need that word. Because you know what the Lord does in covenantal relationships? He puts people on your mind. He puts people in your spirit. He will give a word to somebody when they didn't even expect you to say a word. You have to be intentional. Define your relationship. Then you have to be diligent in strengthening one another. You have to be diligent in strengthening one another. You have to be diligent in learning and being built up. Where do I belong? Number three, I belong in a faith-building community. I belong in a faith-building community. Because now you see the relationship goes from me and Pastor Joe to me and the whole church. Not just to one or two people, but the whole community. That's why it's important for you to be found on a Wednesday night in your tribe. We, had, we heard Reginald come up and say it. And his tribe was busy, woo-woo, because Reginald is in the tribe. You need a tribe around you. More than just having two or three, you need a group of people around you. You need people that will build you. Because 1 John 1 and 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We are here to do good works. We are here to be servants of all for the profit of all. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. There's lots of empty spaces. You know who the some are? Not you, the empty spaces. But exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Yesterday I didn't post. Normally on a Saturday I post a funny. Those of you that watch my statuses. That wants to see what I'm doing in life. <laughs> so on a Saturday I post a funny video of coming to church. Yesterday I posted a video of Dr. Adrian Rogers. Where he speaks about why you must come to church. Because number one, he is important to you. And the last part of it says, it says, because the people next in this building, they are important to you. Our minds should be this golden thread. We are servant of all for the profit of all. So we do not miss the moments we can build community. 
we not miss the moments where we can build one another's faith. We do not miss the moments when as a community we encourage one another. As a community we hold each other accountable. I'm working on a sermon series about accountability. Because in this world we have people that don't take accountability. In this world that we are living in we've got great popular culture figures that you can see and you know they've done wrong, but they will never say sorry, nor will they take accountability. In this community, we hold each other accountable. In this community, we hold each other accountable for the faith that we confess. Not to judge, not to condemn, but to build. We pray for each other. We care for each other. We speak life into each other. We study the word of God together. And we grow in faith together. In the final few moments that I have. The golden thread goes back to where do I belong? And the golden thread goes back to we are servant of all for the profit of all. In this life that we are called to live and to serve the Lord in, we become Christ ambassadors in this world. Because Romans 8 and 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Young people, this world does not love you. Mother, father, this world does not love you. Some of you would say, but pastor, that is harsh. It's not harsh. It comes from the word of Christ. That's his own words. If you go now to your Bible, it will be in red. (laughs) Means it's Jesus' own words. We are in a world that does not love us. How do we know what every law that gets passed, everything that we see in this world is in direct opposition to the righteousness that the church must uphold in this world. And that's why when you vote, it's not about laws and all of these things. It's about who upholds righteousness. It's about who aligns to your understanding of God's righteousness. So as ambassadors of Christ in this world, we are to love God first and then we are to love our neighbors because we are servant of all for the profit of all. As ambassadors to Christ, of Christ in this world, we are to be devoted to reading, to studying, to meditating upon and teaching the scriptures. We are to be salt and light. We are to be mission-minded and we are to share the good news. We are to obey God rather than man. We are to live by and reveal the fruit of the Spirit to the world. Because the world is filled with violence, we are the peace. Because the world is filled with greed, we are kindness. We are gentleness. When the world is filled with self-preservation and selfishness, we are the love that the Lord has called into this world. We are to be thankful in all circumstances. We are to be at peace with everyone. Because the Bible is clear in Romans 12 and 18, if you are not at peace with anybody and everyone, you will not see heaven. We are called to be servant of all for the profit of all. We are called to be servant of all for the profit of all. I apologize. I'm <clears throat> Let us stand. A lot has been said here this morning. 
But I want us to focus on the golden thread. We are servant of all for the profit of all. This morning, you and I must not doubt where we belong. We must not doubt who we belong to. We are his. He is ours. We be accepted in the beloved. We, are, we belong in his will. We belong in life-giving covenant relationships. We belong in a faith-building community. And we belong amongst the ambassadors of Christ. Because you are servant of all for the profit of all. As we raise our hands and we close out in prayer this morning. I want you to think about your own walk before the Lord right now. Are you servant of all for the profit of all? Who is the Lord showing you right now in this moment that you have to serve? And where is the Lord showing you this morning you have to serve? Where is it that the Lord wants you to plug in your gift, your talent, the grace, the anointing upon your life? within the life of the church, that you can fulfill the will and the direction of his purpose and his promise for your life. So as you raise your hands right now, I pray and I ask of you to ask the Lord to make you servant of all for the profit of all. So that when you are in the midst of others, your life speaks to them of who Christ is. Our lives speaks to them of who the Lord has called us to be for them in the season that we meet them, in the season that we serve them, that we become prophet for all. Prophet for all. Father, we raise our hands before you this morning. We surrender it all unto you. Thank you that you call us to greater. You call us to more. You call us to higher. Not only do you call us, but you capacitize this church. You give us greater capacity to be servants of all for the profit of all. You give us greater capacity to be of use for you in this world, oh God. You give us greater capacity to understand who we belong to and where we belong. We do not belong to ourselves. We do not belong to ourselves, O oh God. We belong to you and we belong to the beloved of the Lord. We belong to those whom you are calling us to step into relationship with. We belong in your very will and where people struggle with your will today. Showcase your faithfulness in the midst of it all. Showcase to them your goodness in the midst of it all, that you are with them, you are with them, and you call them to greater. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen.